Perfect. So, hello everyone. Let me welcome you to our third webinar about millennials. This time, we will try to answer the question, are they destroyers or champions of the workplace? Thank you for spending the next 45 minutes with us. A recorded version of this webinar will be available on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn pages of Ecole des Pont Business School. I'm Noel Almi, foremost a senior millennial, a construction project manager, and an MBA graduate from Ecole des Pont. First, I would like to introduce today's our panelists. We'll have with us Dr. Monisha Perla, who joined us from UK, and who is the director of the travel experience business in Windsor with over 20 years experience. She also works with local government enterprises to support local schools in developing career strategies. Monisha completed her doctoral studies at EDP Business School. Also, we'll have Dr. Sirpan Twader, who is joining us from Romania and who is an independent chartered accountant and consultant. He holds an executive DBA from Ecole de Pont Business School too. Sherban worked for one of the big four accounting firms in Romania for 11 years as senior partner. Besides, I have to point out that our two speakers did a lot of research about millennials. Their DBA were focused on millennials and management. So let's see what they found about us. And also try to be generous with your use of the chat box. We will be delighted to have your questions. Uh, um, I will have also with me, and I'm glad to moderate this webinar with another millennial. Junaid, over to you. Thank you, Nawal. Uh, big welcome to all our current and future audience of this webinar. My name is Junaid Guzar Malik, and I'm also a graduate of Ecole de Pont Business School. Uh, I'm primarily a technology professional in the product and design space, but more importantly for our discussion today, a 90s kid and a millennial through and through. Uh, so let's quickly talk about our topic today, Nawal, Millennials in the Workplace, and we'll be touching on four more uh, points of contention around that. Do Millennials lack resilience? Do Millennials need handholding? Are Millennials too entitled in their jobs? And do Millennials struggle with work-life balance? Before we start, uh, developing resilience or the ability to cope with adversity is a critical part of everyone's transition from academics to a professional setting and pretty much all of adulthood after that as well. But if you talk to any employer, educator or parent today, and especially if they're from the generation of Manisha and Sherban, uh, you'll hear anecdotes about young adults struggling to deal with everything in the workplace from severe stress to anxiety uh, to workloads. Um, and so the question begs, when we'll try to answer that today with our audience's help, of course, is that are young people really the champions or the destroyers of the workplace? Or is this simply a familiar example of an older generation of people holding negative stereotypes about younger people? Uh, let's jump into our first case study. Over to you, Nawal. Thank you, Junaid. Let's start then with our first case study, which is about an advertisement made by the British Armed Forces, where we can read, Snowflakes, your army needs you and your compassion. So based on this, we will start a poll. I will ask you, dear audience, to answer this question in the next 30 seconds to see what do you think about millennials? Do you think that millennials lack resilience? A, yes, definitely, B, sometimes, or C, not at all. Let's see what do you think. We will, I think we will have an idea about our audience generation just based on the answers. So a few more seconds. Press the button. We like to see what do you think. Uh, it's unfortunate to see, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can see. Yeah. Ten more seconds. And then... <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think Monisha and Sherban definitely invited their friends over today. <laughs> I'm 
pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, then apparently the majority of the response says that yes, definitely, millennials lack resilience. And the second common answer is sometimes, and the third one is not at all. <laughs> For me personally, and as a millennial, it was pretty shocking to discover how Gen Y or millennials are seen by other generations. Yes, we can be more empathic. But there is no contradiction with being resilient and being kind. We can be both. So, uh, Monisha, I will start with you. Do you think that millennials really less resilient at work? Or is this simply an example of older generations holding negative stereotypes about younger ones? Well, um, I'm glad to see the audience participation. Um, we're not put off by this very provocative advert by the British Army, um, who thinks that millennials lack resilience. And unfortunately, the data does too. So what is research telling us? Well, a few common complaints. With millennials, it's always about feelings. There is less emphasis on fact. They focus very much on how they feel, but with little regard for anyone else's feelings. They respond poorly to critical feedback. How you speak to them often matters more than what you say. And there's a lack of engagement when things become challenging. They're less tolerant of ambiguity. They're more prone to stress and possess less emotional stability. There is a lack of motivation when things not going their way. And doctors have commented on the impact of the pandemic with millennials struggling the most. And finally, optimism, which has been a very big millennial positive is diminishing. So again, I emphasize this is not my opinion. This is research information. We grow from adversity. This is what makes us resilient. However, there appears to be a perception that millennials are struggling with adversity, which in turn can limit their own growth and that of the company. Thank you, Monisha. <laughs> I <laughs> agree with you in some points. And since you evoked mini research, it's really important to note that numerous studies confirm a significant relationship between age and resilience. A baby boomer or Gen Xer is likely to be more resilient than a millennial by the sheer fact of being older. Besides, I think that the current pandemic is a very, very relevant test for millennials' resilience. It could have crushed their spirits. Instead, it has reinforced their desire to help drive positive change in our communities. You know that the last Deloitte report showed that 75% has experienced new issues that have made them even more resilient and the pandemic has inspired them to take positive actions to improve, to improve their own lives and their communities. So Monisha, I'm coming back to you. I don't think that millennials are poorly prepared to deal with life. We are just differently prepared from others. You are right, Noel. Some millennials, like our two wonderful moderators today, are probably more resilient. But unfortunately, data still shows that the perception of companies is that most others do lack resilience. And the solutions have to come from the company and from the millennial. Companies have to stop coddling. Managers have to stop worrying about offending their teams and focus more on developing and improving them. Organizations have to create a culture of resilience, perhaps through introducing a, a, a radical candor, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. It's a must, an environment where you feel comfortable to challenge each other and people are not frightened to speak candidly to their millennial teams. Um, for you millennials, I would ask you to change your mindset. We encourage you to see beyond how someone speaks and focus on their content. Don't see the normal challenges of working life as an issue that prompts you to leave the country, uh, the company, or, or blame the boss. Disagreeable encounters, awkward situations are all part of the work environment. 
Um, we also want to see you incorporate more pragmatism, problems, challenges, these are all life, and they don't reflect on you, but how you deal with them does reflect on you. We'd also like to see you flip your feelings. So before you become offended about how your manager spoke to you, think about how he or she might be feeling. Use that famous millennial compassion that we hear so much about. And finally, research is showing that millennial resilience varies across the world. Now, you guys are going to be competing against millennials from different countries who possibly have higher levels of resilience, which is obviously what organizations want. Thank you, Monisha, for those advices, to which I, I really totally adhere. And since 50% of workers are now considered millennials, and while it's really encouraging to, to know the majority of them are adapting and remain optimistic, companies and business leaders have this responsibility, but, but also it's an opportunity for me to, to find ways to help them fulfill their career ambitions because our collective future depends on it. Now, I think we will move to the second case study. Junaid, over to you. Thank you, Nawal. Um, while we wait for the presentation to come on, there it is. Um, I'll just, I'll just uh, go into some background about this case study. This question is part of an actual research that was done on millennials uh, and circles around Miriam, uh, who is a newly hired financial analyst at a top consulting firm uh, and a firm that she had always dreamt of joining. And while Miriam has always been nurtured and cared about, about uh, by her parents and teachers, uh, she encountered an unexpected reality in her new job. Uh, for instance, her manager is very demanding, uh, distant, and never has enough time for new colleagues and hires. And as a result, Miriam feels uh, insecure because there is not enough feedback given uh, about her work and feels inefficient because there is no clear instruction on how to go about. Uh, so a question, and uh, I, will, I will take this up with my audience as well. Uh, when asked about who her dream manager would be, Miriam chooses one of the following. A, Albus Dumbledore, uh, the magician. Uh, B, Jose Mourinho, the micromanaging footballing genius. C, Steve Jobs, the reality vendor and the tech guru who we all know. Or D, her favorite high school teacher, uh, the confidence builder who really brought Miriam up a level. Uh, so while, while our audience uh, I'll chimes in with their answers, uh, interesting development over here. Uh, Sherban, can you enlighten, uh, enlighten us on the findings of this actual uh, research and uh, maybe share your own thoughts as well as to what Miriam did end up choosing and uh, why you think that is so. Uh, we do have 15 votes in. Uh, large majority have chosen high school teacher. Uh, some have chosen Steve Jobs, uh, one person with Dumbledore, and nobody gave, showing any love for Jose Mourinho. Uh, so, Sherban, over to you. Can you explain the results of our study as well as our audience poll? Of course, uh, Junaid. Uh, this uh, case study is built uh, on my research, but of course, the name of the participant was different. And the explanation I got from my Miriam participant, of course, her name was different, is that her choice for that particular um, teacher is because um, she gave her confidence at the time she felt insecure and anxious as a teenager. And so millennials see figures of authority from their early years as role models and uh, leaders. And of course, that includes parents and teachers, but mainly uh, teachers from uh, school and high school, not so much from college, which are seen as more uh, distant. Now, back to our um, Miriam uh, participant. Uh, she's a young employee, a junior millennial, perhaps. She, of course, needs a lot of attention and care. Uh, young millennials, especially at the beginning of their career, appreciate and need managers who act more like coaches, meaning helping them through the early stages of their career um, and um, also making easier the transition from college to, to work. Mm -hmm. uh, this might not be very well understood by my generation, Generation X, because we grew in a different context. Our parents did not have much time for us and our teachers were tough and distant. That's why our generation is also called the latchkey 
kids' generation, meaning the kids left at home by their parents were at work just with the key from the home. So I think um, if you belong to a different generation, it is wrong to project and assume that what worked for you will work also for, uh, for millennials. Now, millennials are willing to work hard and to prove their abilities as long as they feel that there is somebody there, the manager, yeah, who believe in them and help them build their confidence in a similar way as the favorite teacher did for uh, Miriam while she was in uh, high school. But once they get more mature, more experience, become more comfortable in their job, they might need a different type of support and could potentially change uh, their choice and answer uh, differently to, to that question. Perhaps Steve Jobs, my favorite answer would have been uh, Albus Dumbledore. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, that's, uh, that is very interesting because, for instance, I or many of the people I know might have chosen Jose Mourinho or Steve Jobs because those are people that you learn from. Those are people that you impart knowledge from. And millennials, on average, do say that they are comfortable with working with older management and older generations and value mentors in particular. Uh, but there are always these signs of tensions with uh, such as Miriam uh, with many of the sentiment that older senior management just does not relate to younger workers anymore and their their personal drive or that their personal values are either intimidating or just alien to older generations um, in a study that i was reading uh, almost half of the millennials that there were surveyed felt that their managers did not always understand new working techniques new working methodologies or just their way of using technology at work as well um, and it begs the question of millennials wanting to work with organizations and co-creating with organizations rather than working for. And I think this difference of values and perception really gets amplified when there is a substantial gap in age. Uh, Junaid, if this is how you feel about uh, your manager, not you personally, but uh, millennials, then one way to create more harmony and at the same time stimulate innovation and competence development is through what it is called reverse mentoring. And this approach shifts responsibility for uh, mentoring to the millennials themselves who can, for example, teach more seasoned uh, executives on how to use technology better, for instance, uh, social media or new apps. But the process is really a two-way street and a win-win process because the older mentees also give feedback and also career advice to their younger colleagues. Now, the easiest and the best way to initiate reverse mentoring would be to have some kind of um, dating system between a senior executive and, and young millennials. But if there is nothing like that in your uh, organization, and if you're a senior executive, then I would suggest you leave your pride aside and go look for an ambitious millennial, of which you have plenty in your organization. He or she would be delighted to, to help. On the other side, if you are an ambitious millennial, such as Noal or Junaid here, leave your timidity aside and go find a senior executive in need. There are many in your organization. They would be delighted to have some help from you. And they could also help you with your career. Very well put, Sarban. Uh, I completely agree with putting us out pride and timidity, respectively. Uh, and I think our next case study will will feed more into that. Um, so as we as we just switch over to the presentation again, I'll just give a brief intro of our next case study, uh, which is a quotation by a famous American football player, James Harrison, uh, and. I leave this here for the audience to read as well. Uh, he says, and I quote, I, came, I come home to find out that my boys received two trophies for nothing, participation trophies. These trophies will be given back until they earn a real trophy. I'm not sorry for believing that everything in life should be earned, and I'm not about to raise two boys to be men by making them believe that they are entitled to something just because they tried their best, because sometimes your best is not enough. And that should drive you to want to do better, not cry and whine until somebody gives you something to shut up and keep you happy. Uh, so just uh, before we before we uh, discuss this with Monisha, I'd like to throw in a survey to our participants. 
uh, uh, maybe maybe on the next slide there is uh, what do our participants feel about millennials being entitled? All right, so do do put your answer in, uh, and I will definitely invite Monisha to to chime in as well about her expertise. I'm just reveling in the in the lovely um, results here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's like an insult, but dragged over thirty seconds or one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I can stretch it out a little longer. <laughs> All right. So uh, again, yeah. unsurprisingly, uh, most of our current viewers feel that millennials are definitely entitled um, and a small minority feeling that they are either somewhat or not at all entitled. Uh, uh, Monisha, your thoughts on, on the whole scenario and this case study as well, please. Well, as a Gen Xer, I was delighted to come across this Instagram post. The number of times I've had team members come to me when things go wrong and say, but I tried my best and I would love nothing more than to say to them, your best in this instance was not good enough. But I can't because millennials believe that their best deserves rewards. Now, millennials hearing this will be shouting at me saying, I'm not like that. None of my friends are like that. Don't stereotype us. But research shows that organizations perceive millennials to be entitled. But what do we mean by entitlement? So to a jerkser like me, Deliveroo and a daily coffee from Starbucks are not entitlements, nor is being in a job for five minutes and expecting a pay rise and a promotion, no matter how well I think I've done. Now, my research on SMEs found that millennials felt that they were entitled to holidays whenever they felt like it or to leave during the day whenever at whatever time they they were happy with now these in itself are not entitlements what makes it entitled is that there is little thought to how the business or their colleagues will keep things ticking over in their absence so we have good entitlement and we have bad entitlement high aspiration big ambition that's good entitlement it's bad entitlement that causes the problems. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, as much as I believe that James Harrison, the, the football player from our case study, was somewhat of uh, verging on toxic parenting. Uh, but that aside, you have to see that the economic downturn and the past pandemic especially has had a significant impact on loyalty of millennials and all employees, to be honest. Uh, that employees feel towards their employers and at the same time studies also suggest that gen y our generation is the most passionate about the work they do and the tech giants facebook instagram snapchat you name it are a testament to that and according to even more studies uh, which manisha you can maybe add more context to this generation are committed to their personal learning and their personal development uh, in their workplace and this remains their first choice of benefit in fact from their employers uh, in second place, they they want flexible working hours, uh, something you you mentioned you take issue with, and cash bonuses, for example, come at a surprisingly third place. So millennials are looking for a good work life balance and strong diversity policies, but feel that maybe employers have failed to deliver on those expectations, and work life balance is often taken for granted as well by older management on the assumptions that. Millennials have fewer responsibilities, perhaps, in their personal lives. And um, in the study that I was referring to, more than half said that while companies do talk about diversity and uh, work-life balance, they do not feel that the opportunities are equal for everyone or that the company's values represents their own. And perhaps this is where the, the discrepancy lies. Monisha, what do you think about that? Well, Jeanette, you know, all the things that you've mentioned are actually good entitlements. And actually, Gen Xers like me, we don't have a problem with working from home, flexible working hours, or, um, you know, the whole concept of work life um, blend. Um, the problem we have is with the bad entitlements. Um, and the problem with these is that in a company, due to these bad entitlements, we are starting to stifle creativity and progress because we're very busy rewarding lower standards. 
um, there is an expectation in many organizations that we have a right to privileges rather than earning privilege. Um, the workplace culture is becoming more selfish and transactional of I take, I take, I take, as opposed to a balance of give and take. And this is all being perpetuated because millennials are setting this same example for Generation Z who are now slowly trickling into the workplace. And again, the solution has to come from both parties. From the companies, we need to see them stop giving in. Companies have to rethink the generous onboarding programs, the golden hellos, overcompensating mediocrity, inauthentic gestures of promotion or, or praise. And companies have to show millennials what does good look like? They have to set the example. For the millennials, we're back to a mindset change. Think about a place, a workplace where the praise is authentic and it's not just dished out to you because um, a company is scared that you're going to leave. Um, we want you to be comfortable with a boss who rewards you with a genuinely deserved promotion and doesn't just award it to you in name only to keep you happy. And finally, we need your help to create that environment of give and take. Very true. I definitely agree with the good entitlement part. Um, but I will say that um, perhaps the work-life paradigm has shifted altogether. Cubicles are dead. Uh, mental well-being of employees has been repeatedly proven to be a driver of business success and business growth. And this is what builds strong loyal teams. And I think the test trust deficit here is what needs to be overcome. Technology also a catalyst for intergenerational conflict, like I mentioned before. And I think the long and the short of it is many millennials feel being held back by rigid or outdated working styles. Uh, but I will give you this, that there, there is a trust deficit that needs to be built first before, before these things are taken as a luxury. Uh, I, th I guess we'll, uh, we'll park this case study here and uh, move on to our next one. Uh, maybe Nawal, you want to take over from here? Nawal? Thank you, Junaid. Let's move to our fourth and last case study, which is about Alan. Alan is the founder of a fast growing technology startup that employs many millennials. He appreciates the energy and the creativity of his young crew. But recently, he noticed a disturbing trend. He often finds himself working alone after 6 p.m either at the office or virtually. He is at a loss to understand. So, Sherba, could, could you help us and also Alan to understand what could be more important for his young colleagues than to work hard, to have a successful career and to make a lot of money? Sure. So now I'm going to reveal, reveal something about uh, Junaid and Noel because you are millennials. So you, uh, as millennials, you, you work as a, as a key part of your life, but not as a separate activity that needs to be balanced against other activities. It does not mean that you are not interested in opportunities for advancement or financial rewards. Correct? But at the same time, what millennial wants it's time for friends and family. And they also want a good job and they want to make money and they want to have that promotion and doing the things that they enjoy. So they do all, all, all of uh, those things, but they want it on their terms. And yet at the same time, they don't mind about changing jobs or organization in an effort to have it all. Now, going back to, to Alan, uh, which could be me. Uh, I, the problem is that Alan has a different understanding of what might motivate people at work. And he expects millennials to be motivated by the same things as him at the same age. So what should he do? And my suggestion is that he needs to approach his younger colleague, colleagues with a different mindset, what it is called in literature, a growth mindset. Meaning that first he should suspend his possible bias. Second, to try to understand them, to be curious about them and have an open mind about them. Then very importantly, it's about communication. And he, he has to communicate very clearly what he expects from them. 
and finally spend time with them to coach and, and mentor them. So this is a personal growth uh, opportunity for uh, Alan. I think that his success and his management approach and the success of his organization are linked and should be linked to his younger colleagues' uh, success. Uh, this is how I see it. Thank you, Sherban. Really, as a millennial, I couldn't explain it better than you did. <laughs> and allow me to add something about it. I think that our goal in life is not to have a work-life balance. The goal is to have a harmony. The term work-life balance implies that work is separate from life, but in reality, it's all life. Yet work is not the opposite of life. It's instead a part of it. Just as family is, as our friends and community, hobbies, all of these aspects of living have their share of wonderful uplifting moments and their share of moments that drag us down. So yes, Sherban, we want to have a harmony, a free, fluid, and flexible life to prioritize whatever is most important that day. Do you agree? You know, I really like the, the word that you used, harmony, work-life harmony, so much better than work-life balance. And that harmony concept leads to a workplace uh, value that uh, millennials call very, very dear. And this is freedom or autonomy, but uh, not for the reason that other generation would think. They do not wish to be free of direction or, uh, or supervision. Uh, giving millennials uh, autonomy on the job communicates that you believe in them and that you trust them. Uh, like other generation, um, they detest being micromanaged. However, for instance, my generation, we dismissed the micromanager. We didn't like them because we felt that they were controlling us. But not millennials. Millennials take uh, this uh, micromanaging behavior personally because for them, it looks like a lack of trust or, or confidence in them. So what millennials often say to their manager is the following. Tell us what you expect from us very clearly. Show us how to do it or coach us and then get out of our way. Let us do the job. Yes, Sherban, it's exactly the way that we see it. The majority of my millennials friends and colleagues will agree with me when I, when I say that the most important is not to be early or late. The most important for us is the job to be done, the goal, the deliverables. So just make it clear to us and we assure you that we will do it as perfectly as we can. It, it seems more useful for us to not to try to balance the unbalanceable, but to treat work the same way we do with our personal life by maximizing what we love. So by those words, I think we will move to the Q&A question Q&A session with uh, Junaid. Thank you, Nawal. Uh, so I have a few questions of my own that I would like to, to shoot at our doctoral experts here. Uh, primarily, number one being, what should organizations do or do differently uh, to harness the abilities or special, special talents of millennials that are missing in the older generation? Uh, how can you leverage that uh, as an organization, as a Gen Xer, as just somebody who has to work with the millennial? I, I can uh, take that question if I may. Um, so th there are many things that organizations uh, and uh, millennials should do. So it's not only one or the other, both of them, they should work together to integrate uh, the millennials better in the, in the workplace and also get the best out of them. But because the question was about uh, organization, in my view, managers, so managers from the organization are key to better integrate and get the best out of millennials because uh, managers or leaders, they have the greatest amount of responsibility and influence on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, if you combine this with the um, well-established fact that employees leave managers and not organization, and with this, I, I would like to... Um, um, share with you a Saradoga Institute um, survey which showed that um, uh, the relationship between um, 
uh, an employee and his or her direct uh, super, uh, supervisor uh, counts for 50% of the job employ employment satisfaction. So if you add all this together, I believe that what organization should do would be to equip the managers, including the mid-level managers, but the low uh, level managers as well with the knowledge, the, the know-how, and also the right mindset on how to work with the, the millennials. I think this would be uh, one of the best way to address the challenges of integrating millennials and at the same time getting the best out of millennials or so via their managers directly. Can I add to that? Of course, of course, go ahead, please. Okay, I think uh, added to what Shervan says, which is um, I agree to all of that, I think you also need to look at tech. And you know, companies have to now realize that tech is not just a nice to have, really, cutting edge tech is a, a necessity in any business, no matter how small, how big, or, or in what industry it's located. Um, and so we need to see much more of that. We also need to see a far more creative look at how we are working. And this is something we touched upon earlier, Junaid, about um, shifts, about working weeks, about the type of contracts we're going to be having. Um, and, and finally, um, on the mentoring where we can combine um, abilities and skills from different cohorts, we need to again employ far more creativity. So not only the reverse mentoring, but we need to look at maybe um, anonymous mentoring or group mentoring um, and, and more creative ways of bringing these groups of people together to learn from each other. Interesting, interesting. And me being a technologist, uh and having struggled with this problem, I definitely agree with you, Manisha, as well, that uh, technology is often forgotten. Uh, thank you, Shirban and Manisha, for, for that answer. Let's, uh, let's take another question, which is from uh, my friend and colleague, Ali Raza, who, who asks, it's, it's more of a comment, I will phrase it like a question for both of you, which is that millennials are Gen X and Y and Z, uh, basically, three generations between the ages of 25 and 40, uh, give or take. Uh, why cannot we just trust the fact that they are ready to be autonomous uh, given their age and that they are mature enough to take things and balance things on their own? All generations. This is a very uh, impartial question, of course. Um, go, go on, Monisha. Well, I was going to say, I'm just going to start off, if I, if I have correctly understood the comment, um, uh, you know, we, well, we can't have each generation working independently because we're going to lose so much of talent. So just like us Gen Xers, if we worked in our own little bubble saying we're going to do things the way we want to and the way we've always done it, um, we're going to miss out on so many skills and, and, and so much of knowledge that millennials can give us. And the same applies vice versa. So I don't think we can have ind independent little groups. We have to find a way of incorporating everybody um, and, and benefiting from everything that each generation has to give, be that uh, the boomers, Gen X, um, millennials or Gen Z. Yes, I, I um, just wanted to add on that something that I, um, that I uh, said uh, in the previous uh, webinar. Um, meaning that um, some managers, especially from the older generation, when they went to their business school, they were, uh, they were um, taught the so-called the line of supervision um, management technique, which means the following. If I don't see you, you must not be working. So I think this has to, uh, a lot to do with, uh, with the, the lack of uh, confidence of uh, managers in their employees, not ne necessarily in, in, uh, in generation. And here I would distinguish between effective managers and less effective uh, managers. The more effective managers are, of course, um, more confident in giving the autonomy uh, to, to their uh, employees, and they are open uh, to embrace the ideas of the others. On the other side, you have some managers which are threatened by the idea of uh, living, of giving um, um, freedom because they feel that they don't have things under their control. And uh, that's a very big uh, psychological bias that we'll all have to deal with at some point or another. True, true. Uh, I hope, I hope, Ali, your question does get answered with that. And uh, I'll, I'll shoot another question that I have uh, for the both of you. 
And it is that how should organizations tailor recruitment strategies to get on board millennials faster and better or better? How, how can they tailor their HR policies to retain millennials better and keep them satisfied employees of their, of their organizations? I can, I can start, Monisha, if you wish. Yeah. I've, I've seen two types of, uh, of companies uh, doing uh, the recruiting. Um, and um, I've seen many times how companies which are very eager to, to um, recruit the best talents are delivering the wrong message to the wrong people at the wrong times. And I will explain you how, how this works. So on one side of uh, the, the labor market, you have some companies which are desperate to hire young people for jobs which they feel that they are not very appealing, or maybe the industry is not very appealing. So what this company do, and what I've seen in practice is that they make, make the mistake of turning their recruiting process into a very elaborate marketing sales pitch. And the problem with that is that prospective employees get the wrong idea about the job that they are applying because that's how they believe. And then when they join the, the company, they are quickly disappointed that the job is not as, as, as advertised. And uh, soon in months, sometimes in, in just week, that person is uh, unhappy and frustrated and might, might leave. Um, and what they would say to their managers or to the HR manager is that, yeah, but I'm here and I'm not doing the job uh, that you told me that I'm going to do. So that's one side of the market. On the other side of the market, you might have some companies like investment banks or technology companies who are very selective in choosing new, new employees. But here the problem is that, um, that they, their process is too cumbersome, too long. It takes too long. You know, it takes a there are gaps between the job offers and acceptance and the lack of communication and so on. So people are lost in between the, those uh, lines. So now one, uh, one uh, suggestion, uh, so um, it's uh, about attracting more talent is would be to, to, di diversify, um, to diversify the sources of uh, recruitment because what I could see is that um, many of organizations, what they do is they go look for recruits in the same business school in the same place, place for many years. And the problem with that strategy is that getting people from the same business school again and again might lead first to a homogeneous, so all the people will look the same. And perhaps the competition, your competition will also find recruits in the same place. So it really becomes a very small lake with not so many um, people to, to be recruited. So. I would say if you are a financial institution, if you are a consulting firm and you have always recruited from the same business school, try also engineering schools or try other business schools. I would say try the MBAs from, from Ecole de Pont. Why not? Of course. Full marks on that one. <laughs> Uh, Manisha, would you like to just add on that? Um, yeah, so I, I would only add, I agree with everything Sherban said. I think the only thing that uh, a lot of companies are struggling with is not so much the recruitment of the millennials, but the retention of the millennials. Um, and to do this, we, we, need to, we need to make sure that their career within our organizations remains a learning experience. And we've spoken about that in, in previous webinars. Another thing you have to do is make sure that your purpose as an organization aligns with their principles and they have to keep feeling that they are developing, that they are learning, that they are gaining more skills and developing not only career wise, but as an individual as well. So each step that they take in your organization is an investment in themselves. Um, and we spoke earlier about flexibility that's a huge one the more flexibility and surveys have shown the more flexibility you can offer them the more attractive to a millennial and very finally something that i i read um just a, a couple of weeks ago in the in the papers um was that staying in board on uh, in touch with your millennials even after they've left your organization is very important so the whole offboarding program is as important as onboarding true true uh, happy employees, whether they're coming or going, are always an asset to the company. Uh, I strongly agree with that. Uh, and thank you as well, Sherban, for, for answering this question. Uh, I, think, I think we have answered all of the questions in the chat. I'll hand it over to you, Nawal. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for uh, those insights. And uh, before closing our webinar today, I would like to give our distinguished panelists, Monisha and Shirban, 30 seconds to one minute each to wrap up and share with us their answer to our webinar question. Are millennials champions or destroyers of the workplace? Monisha, would you start? Right, well, um, at present, we are seeing that in some organizations, millennials are the champions, but in too many, they are the destroyers. Um, not so much of the workplace, but more of the destroyers of the potential of what that workplace could be. So for the company, in order to fix this, it's all about embracing the millennial positives, incorporate all the good millennial stuff, the flexibility, the boldness, the innovation, but companies also have to stand firm against the things they don't like. Now, organizations are the ones often complaining about the issue of resilience or the lack of, you know, the, the entitlement. But at the same time, they're the ones who are perpetuating the problem through their own management techniques. So for organizations, we need to see them start building an environment of give and take, of candor. Um, and of authentic praise and reward and not being so fearful of offending millennials. And for millennials, it's about focusing on empathy for others, making difficult situations less about you, bringing in pragmatism into your lives and making feelings less important and the messages more important. And if, if you can do this, then I do believe that millennials can be the champions of the workplace. Thank you, Monisha. Pretty clear, we are champions if we uh, reinvent the organization, the mindset of both millennials and uh, companies leaders. So what about you, Sherban? Do you agree? What do you think about the answer of our question? Well, uh, Noel and uh, Junaid, first of all, I wanted to say that it was a pleasure to be facilitated by, by you. Um, you had the power in this uh, webinar, and I have a good feeling about millennials taking the, the power. And back to, to, the, to the webinar question, whether the millennials are destroyers or champions of the workplace, my answer is simple, and it is both. Um, it is not chaos or anarchy that millennials want to see in the workplace or to eliminate managers or organizational structure or companies altogether. Of course, they, they take work very seriously. It is an important part of their life, but then they realize that they want themselves and their organization to be successful. And in order to achieve that, some things uh, clearly would have to change. So I would say that they are changing the world workplace and champion a new workplace. Millennials will push and perhaps frustrate some of the managers from the, from the previous generation but also you, they will also help the organization and managers to win going forward. Thank you, Sherban. If my, may I use the same wording as you? Millennials are destroyers of the old workplace and they are champions of a new workplace. So what is sure is that we are, or millennials are reshaping the workplace and yes, the intergenerational work is one of the most important challenges in managing companies. But it should be more comforting to know that for all their diversity, different generations fundamentally want the same thing. And while they differ in how they think about getting what they want, these diverging modalities can be reconciled in a way that creates a more fulfilling work experience for everyone. By those words, I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. I would like also to thank Shirban, Monisha, and Junaid for their interesting thoughts. Without forgetting Sabri and Karin from Ecole de Pont Business School for their kind support for this webinar and all the series. Again, thank you, dear audience. Sorry if we were not able to answer uh, the questions that come after. You can just email them to us and we will make sure to answer them. Again, if you wish to learn more about millennials, and this time, especially global or international millennials, to know if they are all the same all over the world or not, regardless of geography, are they sharing the same concerns, aspirations, and expectations? So if you are curious to know the answer, make sure to attend the next webinar on the 16th of June, 
Thank you again for joining us. Looking forward to see you. Enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you all for joining. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>